So I, I want to ask you, you have a new book. Um, it's called Late Admissions. I remember reading over, it's a very shocking book because it's deeply, deeply honest. And we were talking about it a little bit before the show as well. Um, you admit in there crack use and cheating on your wife and just like crazy stories. Like, as you said, these are things that I acknowledge that nobody, you don't want anyone to ever know about you, let alone think about you. And we talked a little bit about why the memoir, but I just want to kind of go back into that. Why did you write the memoir? Uh, just, you know, it's an interesting choice to do as a economist and a thinker and kind of somebody who's known as a thinker to go and write this brutally honest autobiography. Yeah, well, as I answered you when you asked me, in the first instance, I needed a project uh, <laughs> because the theoretical ideas for the math papers and economics weren't coming as quickly as they used to come when I was 30 years old. Uh, and, you know, a person has to give an account of himself. Uh, so what am I doing? What am I working on? What's my project? And uh, I settled maybe 10 years ago on the idea that I'd write a, uh, an, an autobiography because I had some pretty good material to work with, you know. Working class kid off the south side of Chicago ends up uh, at uh, father at the age of 18 and again at 19 and again at 21. Uh, kid born out of wedlock, uh, you know, uh, scrambling around a community college, you know, get, becoming an intellectual when I get discovered by one of my teachers, ending up at MIT, math whiz, uh, you know, so to speak, and, you know, uh, all of that. Uh, but uh, I was going to say dogged or plagued by certain demons and, you know, um, wanting to be an authentic uh, person from the streets, you know, even though the streets were long behind me by the time I ended up at a place like MIT or a place like Harvard. Uh, and becoming a, a heterodox figure in terms of my politics and going through all of what one goes through when you vote for Ronald Reagan, even though you were born on the south side of Chicago in, in the early 1980s and things like that. So I thought I had a story to tell Harvard you know, I'm 33 years old when I become a tenured professor at Harvard. I'm a hot shot. Uh, but I'm, I'm also like my uncle's nephew. And I'm, I'm you know, a guy that doesn't mind, you know, a, a little bit of action. And I'm, I'm looking for a thrill. And I'm, I'm on the wild side. I'm walking on the wild side. I, I'm on the edge. I, you know, and, and I, I fall in love with being on the edge. This is my history, which I'm contemplating as I think about whether or not I want to write this memoir, and I think I got some material. I'm on the edge. I'm living seminar room by day, uh, get housing project by night. I know what a crack <laughs> house is. I know what they do there. I'm doing it. Uh, I know what it means to have a wonderful wife and uh, devoted spouse uh, at home, but to also enjoy the prerogatives of a guy who runs the streets and et cetera, and I'm playing both sides of the street. And I think I've got some material to work with. I end up with a crisis of confidence when I'm at Harvard. I changed my career path there, et cetera. I end up uh, with a, a mistress that I'm keeping in a, an apartment in the south end of Boston and it blows up in my face when we have a big fight and she accuses me of assault and it becomes a public thing and whatever, whatever. I won't go into too much detail. I'm just saying I got some material to work with. I end up a crack addict, okay, by degrees. It didn't happen all in one day, but it happened. <laughs> a little bit of cocaine here, a little bit of cocaine there. The next thing you know, you're smoking it every day and it's taking all your money and it's all you care about and, you know, whatever. I end up a born-again Christian because I wanted to stop doing cocaine because the c Christian community was a loving embrace because there are some answers for some people in faith. It's not a game. It's not silly. It's a serious matter. I end up abandoning my religion because I'm an intellectual and I realize that it's a serious matter. It's not a game. On the other hand, man, virgin birth, resurrected from the dead. Can I really believe that? And I ask myself these questions and so on. So I had material to work with. Um, I started out thinking that it was supposed to be about politics. 
Then I thought it was supposed to be about the enemy within. I, at first, I thought it was about changing my mind. You know, I was on the left, I was on the right, I was on the left. When I was on the left, they liked me. When I moved to the right, they didn't like me. But the people on the right liked me. But then I didn't like them, and so I moved back to the left. And then they didn't like me anymore as much. And the ones on the left who I left when I went to the right, who were welcoming me back when I went, moved back to the left, were they really my friends? Why was I doing it? This kind of stuff. Uh, I thought it was about politics. Then I thought it was about uh, the enemy, and I was going to call the book Changing My Mind. Mm. Then I thought it was about life challenges, like how do you overcome drug addiction? Like what about uh, that woman who stood by you while you were, you know, going out there doing everything under the sun? Uh, you know, uh, what about your loss of uh, confidence when you were at Harvard and you didn't think you were good enough to be there? And this is a, back to what we were talking about earlier, I'm black. If I hadn't been black, as my uh, esteemed senior colleague Tom Schelling told me, you think you're the only one who's afraid of failing here at Harvard? Every one of your colleagues is a neurotic hiding behind their secretaries, worried about somebody asking them to justify their existence. Relax and do your work. But I was black. And I couldn't help but think they were looking at me as a black person. And I, and I had all this stuff going on. So I was going to call the book The Enemy Within because I thought the struggle against various enemies, addiction, phony faith or real faith, is it, wh what is it? Confidence in myself as a person who might fail, because everybody might fail, but who quit the field too soon because he didn't want to be the only black guy in the office who was also the also-ran guy. Whatever. And, and I, I thought the book was going to be about the internal struggle to live authentically and in good faith, as I've said, uh, as a black man in the tw 20th century America. And, and, and I thought it was that. And then I realized uh, that I didn't truly understand my own life. And I realized that the right vision for the book was a engagement with this, uh, I call it the problem of self-regard, an engagement with this recollection of what actually happened and a coming to grips with what really happened. Because I had told myself one cover story after another of self-justification. And I realized that if I exposed this self duplicity, this, this kind of, uh, oh, I told myself that story because it was uh, what I needed to say. Oh, for example, I told myself that the economics department at Harvard was cold and indifferent, and that the reason that I needed to move out of economics and into public policy, which I did do, and I changed the direction of my career from green eye shade, technical theorist to uh, a pundit who would comment on public affairs and uh, do stuff for the Kennedy School, which I, mo I moved to. Uh, I told myself that that was because uh, they were pushing me out at uh, Harvard at economics and they were cold and they were indifferent, but the real reason was that I lost my nerve. I choked. Uh, and, and I told myself a variety of stories of, like that, which weren't true. And in retrospect, I saw that they weren't true. And I realized that uh, I had built my whole account of my life on a uh, less than fully credible foundation and that the process of self-revelation was worth sharing mm. with the world. I'm not the only person in this existential dilemma, I thought. And I thought, now we're getting close to a book. Now, not, now we're getting close to something that will move people in their gut. And I tried to execute on that idea. And kind of, um, I guess, re-narrativizing your life or trying to understand why you made decisions that you made in the past. Is there anything, if you could communicate one or two things to your past self, um, I, I guess something you would consider profound or insightful maybe that, that took you a long time to figure out. Is there anything you wish you could have been able to impart on yourself as a 20 or 30 year old? Or do you think all of it had to be learned through experience or? Yeah. Um, 
When I came out of graduate school, my first job was at Northwestern University Economics Department, which had been my alma mater. I was an undergraduate at Northwestern, so I was delighted to come back triumphant as a young assistant professor. Um, it was a very dynamic department in my field of economic theory, and three of the people who were a part of my cohort of young, new scholars coming to Northwestern ended up, uh, it's now, almost 50 years since 1976 with Nobel honors. Three of them working on stuff that they were only beginning to think about when I was among them. They were my peers. I thought of myself as the equal of any of them, at least that's kind of what I told myself, but in fact, did I really? I get to Harvard, I'm watching them rise, and I'm feeling stagnant, and I'm afraid of failure and I lose my nerve. I'm afraid of failure in part because I don't want to be the black guy who failed. I quit the field when I might have been able by staying the course to join their ranks. I might have, I might not have. It's okay not to win the Nobel Prize. It's okay to be, you know, a guy who's pretty good, who's a journeyman, who's accomplished, who's published, who's done good work. Uh, but not to be the best in the world. But I quit the field without finding out whether or not I was actually fit. I don't know even to this day if I would have in the fullness of time measured up to the same extent. My expectations for myself were extraordinarily high, so high that rather than disappoint them, I found something else to do. I don't like that. Uh, about myself. Uh, I, I don't like the fear of failure and the embarrassment of being the only black guy in the room and not being at the top of the heap. Um, there's something uh, inauthentic about that. There's, there's something cowardly about that. Um, now, when I tell people this story who know my life's history, they say to me, I'm so glad you didn't choose to stay a technical economist because you write brilliantly and you're the most interesting person I know. Literally, people say that to me. They say, you're an intellectual of the first rank. Why did you have to be a green eye shade economist doing stuff that nobody was going to read? And there's, I think, something to that argument. But deep down inside, I know that guy. That guy wanted to be a technical economist of the first rank. That's really all he cared about, and he quit. Um, and I don't like that about myself. <laughs>